The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, MLC Limited, ABN 90 000 402, AFSL 230694, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Ryan Watson, CEO of Trebeca Financial, Australia's leading financial wellbeing advice firm. You're listening to a podcast series dedicated to exploring and understanding all things wellbeing through a financial advice lens. This is a special four-part mini-series from the Ensemble podcast. Over four episodes, we will talk with practitioners and wellbeing experts to understand financial wellbeing, what are its foundations, how can it be used in a personal sense, as well as taught as a practice to clients. Vivo is the award-winning health, wellness and recovery service from MLC Life Insurance. It supports people at every stage of life's journey, in sickness and in health. Vivo is available at no additional cost to MLC Life Insurance customers. And because we know advisors are the backbone of our industry, MLC Life Insurance offers some Vivo services for free to our partner advisors and their staff. To find out more, contact your distribution representative today. Welcome, Marshall. Thanks for your time today. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, great to uh, be part of the podcast. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, and and from your point of view and you know MLC Insurance as well, thank you for sponsoring the series. This is the fourth episode where we'll look more specifically to advisors and how they stay at the top of their game. So obviously my role at Tribeca, you know, I suppose I've been on one side of the fence for one of a better term. So I'm really interested to lead into to your experience, Marshall, from a uh, product manufacturer's point of view and how you get this insight into different advice practices and they how they, uh, as we said earlier, how they really stay at the top of their game. But I think as a way to introduce yourself to the audience, Marshall, if we could invest a couple of minutes in terms of your background, how you came to be in uh, in this profession, financial planning. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, so my journey is not dissimilar to a lot of people, I suppose, in, in that uh, I had a, a family background. So my father was a financial planner. Um, and, and funnily, that's something that um, I was at a breakfast with the minister, Stephen Jones, last week, and and he mentioned that as you know a common pathway into the industry is you know people come in because they had a a relative or a family friend or whatever who was a financial planner, uh, yeah. and it was true for me. So my dad uh, ran his own business, um, so I you know was involved in the industry, um, used to do some work in there on school holidays and whatnot, and kind of got exposed to the industry a little bit. Yeah. Uh, long story short, you know, he kind of um, has been retired for over kind of 10, 12 years now and exited the business right as the time that I was kind of finishing uni and coming into the industry. And um, I uh, got a job at OnePath in the, the new business area there as my kind of first uh, role. And then I've mm-hmm. moved on from there to a couple of different roles. And my current role with MLC Insurance is um, risk and strategy advice managers kind of look after all of our education proposition for advisors. Okay. Uh, probably maybe a bit of a random question, Marshall. Could you see a time in the future where you uh, where you might, I suppose, be an active advisor? The either the dark side or the light side. That's it. I wasn't sure that. Or the position that, to be honest, given the context and the, the sponsor and the like, but that uh, you're currently employed with. But yeah, depending on where you sit. Yeah, no. Look, it's something I, I do get that question um, now and again. And yeah, I'd certainly never say never to it. I think when you come from that background of being around a, a small business and a financial planning business daily and seeing the relationship with the clients and you know the immense amount of value that it can bring, um, you certainly get a pretty uh, fond um, uh, thinking of the, the financial planning business. So yeah, I certainly would never say never. It could happen at some stage. You just don't know. Okay, cool. Uh, fantastic. Um, obviously, the headlines around you know why you and I are talking today, specific around well-being and that greater financial well-being piece. You know, from MLC Insurance's point of view, what 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 does what does wellbeing mean to you guys? Yeah, it's something that has become increasingly important. You know, both when we look about, I know some of the previous episodes have really looked at the ways that 
advisors can engage clients around well-being, and that's something that's become a lot more prevalent. And and obviously MLC insurance through Vivo, and then other insurers through a whole lot of other areas have brought in all of these different methods to engage clients around wellness. But obviously, from an advisor perspective, at the same time over the last few years, we've seen this environment where there's just pressures coming from every different direction. Um, yep. And ultimately, that's impacted the ability for uh, advisors who, uh, let's face it, are the most important partner for a retail life insurance business to productively give advice and, and recommend um, insurance to clients and, and productively engage in their businesses. So I think it's really important to take an interest in thinking about you know, how advice businesses can better, A, sure, look after your clients and their well-being, but also... Uh, look after your own well-being first. I think I saw the quote the other day, um, you know, it's a bit like fitting your oxygen mask before, you know, fitting those of others. Um, it's all great to want to help people, but you need to be able to have yourself um, sorted out first. Yeah, spot on. So it sounds like um, from MLC's uh, insurance's point of view, Marshall, there's much more of a focus uh, on, on the helping piece and understanding advisors' practices and obviously particularly what their clients need. And then how do you come to them with genuine solutions that add value both in a qualitative space, but also a quantitative space as well? It is. Yeah. Then there's different, you know, solutions there. I think the obvious ones in in that more kind of quantitative space you talk about are some of the practical solutions around, you know, actually making it a bit easier in, in your business. So, you know, they're things all insurers are looking to do around, you know, improving processes, things like taking alterations online and quotes online and trying to save some time things like that help in that space. Um, if you go in more into that qualitative space you mentioned, um, that's some of those things around, you know, some of the wellbeing propositions through um, Vivo, for example, and then being made available to advisors as well as clients. Um, you know, that offers things like, you know, your mental health support, your nutrition consults, your fitness consults, things that can add a little bit more around the edges of some of those practical things. Cool. Now, given that you've mentioned it, Marshall, and I've got a put my hands up here because I've got some slight ignorance around this. Can we do a bit of a deeper dive around that, what that actually means, how people are actually engaging with it at the moment? I'm really keen to learn more. I'm sure our listeners are as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, Vivo is something that's available to uh, all policyholders of, of MLC insurance and their, their family members. Um, but also then last year was made available to advisors as well. So uh, And their staff, importantly, which I think is often okay. overlooked is you know, there's a whole proposition there around um, how we look after our staff. So um, it has, through the Vivo Virtual Care, a whole range of services available from uh, Mental Health Navigator, which is your, your mental health support, um, uh, fitness consults, an exercise physiologist, um, nutrition consults with a dietitian, uh, and then also includes things like your expert medical opinion. And I'm sure, I mean, many of the listeners probably have heard of uh, Best Doctors. It was often called in the past, and that's been around for many, many years, and that's basically the, the modern iteration of that. So it encompasses all of those services that, that people can take up to uh, set themselves up to, to get a bit more out of their uh, their well-being day to day. Cool. And what's, you know, general rule or um, talking in generalities, obviously, Marshall, what's the current take up of those services from clients, advisors and staff within the office? I imagine there's, there's plenty of opportunity. There is there's plenty of opportunity. Yeah, we, we're certainly um, uh, always looking to see those numbers increase. I think we've gradually seen an increase in the client space, um, people uh, wanting to, to take it up. Um, and look, it's relatively new to the advisor space, so there's been, been limited uptake in that space. In saying that, um, I know there is a few examples where people have engaged in and got a lot of value. So you know, um, speaking to a few of the, the BDMs around the country, they've had um, a few, particularly around the expert medical opinion um, scenarios where yeah. they've been able to get, you know, some really important uh, reassessments of conditions for people um, that you know, they were really struggling with and had a bit of a dead end um, with their yeah. current treatment, et cetera, that have kind of opened a bit of a new world and then the opportunities for recovery. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity there if people want to take a look. Um, and yeah, have a chat to your, your local BDM or jump on um, the Vivo Wellbeing website um, and have a bit of a look at it. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, it's good. That's good to know. Like I said, um, you know, whilst I'm the host, I, I don't did, haven't known about it. Not a day to day practitioner, so that's good for the listeners. They can obviously go to the website and find out some more about that. Um, 
key part of today as well, Master, is what we wanted to explore is what you're seeing in advice practices. You know, if we start with the importance of advisors and then looking after their own mental health when they're working with their clients, um, what, what are you seeing in that space in terms of from advisors? Yeah, I think we're, we're starting to see a, a more, um, I guess a little bit more of a reflective attitude, I think, from advisors around it to kind of acknowledge that we've been through a, a really challenging period, but also acknowledge to say that, well, you know, if I'm not perhaps, you know, operating at my best in this space, it's pretty hard for me to do really well for my clients. And if that's my ultimate end goal and I want to get great outcomes for my clients, I need to have myself kind of in this frame of mind to be, you know, happy going to work, um, productive uh, in 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 my workplace and in my business, um, and productive with um, my staff and my team to make sure that you know everyone's um, happy moving forward. So I think we're at a bit of an interesting place with um, financial advice businesses where we're seeing a bit more of a focus on that um, than we've seen in the last probably five to ten years. Mm. I was reading some stats the other day as well through a through a leadership coach who's got a lot to do with financial advice in Australia. And I think in terms of that mental health piece and people being affected, I I, I won't do it justice because I can't remember the specific uh, number, but it was a significant portion of the financial advisor population that has been affected to some degree around mental health and the challenges over the last five to seven years. I was really surprised, Marshall. Yeah, it'd be impossible not to. I mean, there's obviously various degrees on that spectrum, you know, from more acute symptoms to um, you know, things that are, you know, um, less noticeable, perhaps, you know, things that can creep up to you, like in more of your day-to-day stress uh, and that feeling of busyness or, or anxiety around work, et cetera, just because the load is getting large. So there's obviously a spectrum that it's on. Um, and it's a matter of, I think, at a starting point, just sitting back and, and having to think about what that actually looks like yourself. And then, you know, thinking about, okay, well, what can I actually do about it to, to perhaps try and you know, make it ultimately. We want to make it a bit more fun uh, if we can, and, and that'll help people um, feel better in their business. Yeah, and you mentioned that term around you know helping people in their business and your role, and something that binds all this collegiate piece around the financial advisory industry is that we all got in to help people or to help clients, no matter what your value proposition is, whether it's more qualitative, whether it's more quantitative, acting bits, whatever it is. Everyone got here to put clients in a bit better position and help, but it's interesting. The challenge is there's been such a self-focus with compliance and everything else. I'm not saying it got lost, but there's just been so much noise. It's coming back to, I know it's probably overused around purpose, but coming back to why we're genuinely here. And I love the fact, Marshall, you brought up making it fun again. There's nothing more fun around. You see a client where a light bulb moment goes off. They really buy into what you're doing and then they're empowered to go away and execute the strategy. I think fun's very underrated, Marshall. It is. It is. No, I think, you know, ultimately that's the driver is those kind of positive feedbacks is, yeah, seeing that moment with a client or you know, helping a client with a claim and, and seeing the impact for, for them and their family. Now, these little moments that, yeah, they're the, the little penny drops that goes, gee, it, it is worth it. And it's frustrating at times, but it really is worth it to get some of those outcomes. So um, I think, yeah, you're right. The focus perhaps hasn't been on that from a purpose perspective. And I think you know, with a lot of the change that we're now seeing come through, uh, the government has probably acknowledged that. And, and we're seeing that, you know, it really is now about thinking about the client and getting more financial advice to, to more clients and getting better outcomes for clients. So I think we're at a stage now in kind of the life cycle of the industry where um, we're in a position to look at that again and think about, well, yeah, let's get back to actually looking after more clients um, and getting good outcomes for clients. Yeah, get back to why we got here in the first place, if that makes sense. You get back to that why for sure. Yeah, okay. Um, so, if we, you know, we're thinking about examples of what you're seeing in advice practices and we understand how important a mindset is. You know, what are some what are some examples you've seen around advisors who are doing this really well, who are practicing some good self-care? Yeah, I think some things that I've seen work really well and the benefits I've had, obviously, in my current role is kind of, um, national based around the country, but in a previous life was more local based in a, in a BDM type role. And um, some of the benefits were really around seeing people start to band together at a local level a little bit better, you know, thinking about, well, can I find five to 10 people in my local advice community that want to catch up for a coffee once a month or a breakfast yeah. once a quarter 
or you know we had a few um, who were uh, all keen golfers and would catch up for an early morning Friday game once a month and get a, a like-minded group together of advisors had never met each other before but after doing that for five six months you know people start to enjoy seeing that same person again or how did you go with that client you mentioned last month? How did you go with that? Are you hiring someone new in your business? You know, did you end up getting that sorted out? That new software you were doing, did that work out for you? You know, you build these relationships and these sounding boards and you actually start to realize that some of the problems that you think are exclusive to you and your business are probably shared by your mate down the road who's going through the same thing um, and probably has some learnings they can share with you about it. I love the facts that you've mentioned that. So, um, because I know when I started out in advice, 05, 06, and then I went to the AFA conference in 07, it was there that I met a number of advisors, um, Brad Fox as well. So he's a chairman here at Tribeca, obviously a partner and a shareholder as well. But the point being around the relationships that were built, and we ended up setting up a lunch on a quarterly basis, and we'd get together and we'd share the wins and share the learnings. That old school but works really well. There wasn't a problem that we couldn't solve or improve amongst us, and I think it's easy to say COVID and the like, but being far more collegiate, I know, you know, throughout my journey, there's a lot of people in the industry who have helped or extended the time I would have a coffee. That's the opportunity. I love the fact that that's part of, you know, what you're doing or what you're seeing, Marshall. It's so, so underrated. It is. And look, I think you're right. Look, COVID certainly played a part in it that we've all kind of had to re reintegrate back into the face-to-face um, world after that. But I think also that general... Um, busyness and, and need for feeling for pro- productivity can can feed into it where people think, well, oh, I just haven't got time to devote to that because I need to do X, Y, or Z. Um, but the thing is, is it is actually productive, like taking that time to uh, network, build relationships, share some problems, get some advice. That is very, very productive time. And you'll find that, you know, say, if you had a breakfast catch up with a few like-minded advisors in the morning, and you're out before nine o'clock and you're back to the office, um, you're energized to take on the day. Like you, you've had some great conversations. You're actually going to jump in and be more productive than if you hauled yourself to the office an hour earlier and perhaps procrastinated for an hour or had a coffee, try to wake yourself up and try and get into things. You're actually jumping straight into it with a few ideas and ready to go. So I think it's just around shifting that that perception of what productivity actually is. I think so. And I think the more siloed we are because, you know, largely it's an industry, but with this transition to profession that is is very much siloed. So there's licensees and the like, but the ability to not join for, but the ability to, like I said, share those wins, share those learnings. There's not a problem that someone else hasn't encountered. And for the fact that there are different value propositions and the like, a lot of, you know, under the bonnet of what we do is quite similar tech and the like. So how can we help each other? We know there's never been more clients with which to serve. I think recent surveys in the industry, up to 15,000 advisors, but only 5,000 are taking on new clients. So nothing we can't learn, and there's plenty of clients to help. It's almost, um, without being critical, it's almost in part getting out of our own way and focusing on what's really important. What are those big rocks we need to focus on to help, like you said earlier, help more clients? Yeah, I think you're right. It's that you know that rising tide floats all boats um, scenario. When I've looked at the data and the FSC did some data around underinsurance last year. Um, and I think when I crunched the numbers on the volume of uh, people in the Australian population, they classified as underinsured versus the amount of advisors we'd had. It would need to be like an extra 300 clients per advisor to meet that demand. So there's certainly no shortage of clients out there to look after. So it's in everyone's interest to, to help everyone else. There's more than enough clients to go around to uh, to make everyone very, very busy, probably more busy to your point around, you know, turning down clients uh, more busy than you would even need to be. Yeah. So we've talked about, Marshall, advisors in general. Like if I was to ask you around, you know, thinking of a few advisors who uh, are really good at what they do, you might call them high performers. What would be some key highlights around, I imagine they've got really good habits. Like what would be some key things around there or some learnings for the listeners? I think one of the big learnings in that space that I've identified over the years is really this power of delegation um, and empowering your team. So you you can often feel like you need to do everything yourself. And I know I can be a little bit like this sometimes as well as you can, you know, hang on to things and be a bit of a control freak and want to do it yourself. But 
the ability to identify where someone in your team and empower them to go out and, and do some of those tasks in the business then frees the advisor up to do the really productive work that needs to be done with clients and with the business. Uh, I think that comes with with client communication as well. Like empower your team in the face of your clients. You know, they should be expected to to speak to your team as well as just yourself and be comfortable doing so. So it takes that pressure off of all well, my only point of contact with the business is with my advisor. Um, no, we've well, actually got a team of two or three people or more that mm. I'm equally comfortable speaking to if I need to. It just takes that pressure off and frees up some of that time and then sets some proper boundaries as well. Yeah, it's it's interesting exploring that a bit further around. I think there's there's a tendency for any type of professional to just get a bit comfortable with what they're doing. And I think playing in the micro, playing too much in the detail and that day-to-day rhythm, it can just get too comfortable. But growing the people around you, delegating, and then challenging yourself to play in different spaces or where you can really add value, I think I think there's some bravery in that yeah it, it it's it's an interesting one why we do what we do it is and look there's a great practical technique you can use around this and look some of the listeners if they've been around uh the risk industry or mdrt and whatnot for a little while might have seen russell collins speak before and and russell's a bit of a legend from america in the the insurance advice space but in his book he's got a great tool around actually doing a bit of a time sheet for uh two weeks around the tasks that you complete yourself but then okay. doing a bit of a, a review at the end of that period to say, well, which of these do I actually have to do or which of these could I delegate to someone else? Whether yeah. you've got that team member already or not, if you don't have them, what you've just built is a job description. You've built the job description already for what you need, how many hours you need and what you need someone to do. Yeah. Uh, and if you've already got the person there, you go, well, here's exactly what I want you to do. And now I know the tasks and you've just freed up X many hours in your diary. So. Sometimes it can be as simple as that to actually then work out, well, then instead of perhaps doing those extra really stressful hours, I don't need to do that. I can focus on the important stuff that I need to do. Yeah. And at the risk, Marshall, putting you on the spot, um, would you have access to that sheet? Is that something where we might be able to put a link in uh, in this podcast when it goes live? I, I, I don't myself. Well, I do have a copy of the book, but I don't know yep. if it's online. It's called Skills to Succeed. Okay. It's the book by Russell Collins. It is a bit of a, um, in the risk advice space, it's a bit of a Bible. It's a, a well-known book with a lot of good tips and, and tricks in there. So if you don't have it, go out and get it. Absolutely. Yeah, have a look at it. Okay. Fantastic. So moving more to the impact the, the advisors you see are having on, having on their clients, how are you seeing value propositions in the advice space, you know, evolve to incorporate more of the well-being? Yeah, I think it's really evolved to be that more holistic view. I think part of it's a generational thing because I've looked at some research around this as well. When you look at um, that millennials and, and Gen Z particularly that are coming through and, and these people that are now starting to see financial advisors, like they've, they're young professionals, they're, they're in that accumulation phase, they're going, what's next? What do I do now with with my money? Um, the focus for them is not actually on their overall wealth. It's on what does it actually do for me? Does it mean that I can you know do certain hobbies that I enjoy, achieve certain lifestyle goals that I enjoy? Like that's what the money actually does for me. So I think yeah. for a value proposition perspective, you know the advisors who are building that into the conversations to go. By all means, it's great for us to do all the technical stuff that we do, and we've got heaps of knowledge in that space that so we can do it for you. But what we're actually focusing on is what that means for you and what that can actually deliver for you in a lifestyle perspective. Like that's where you really cut through to, to giving that holistic view to clients. Yeah. And you, you, you're seeing more of a move to that space. Obviously, we know what I would call doing the doing is really important. So quantity, so minimizing fees, strong returns, appropriate, you know, minimizing taxes. That's that's more of a given these days. Is there is there is this evolution more into this financial wellbeing space? There is. Yeah, I think it is. You're right. All of that is the the given. You know, I think we've got uh, such high levels of professionalism now and, and knowledge and education in the industry that all of that technical side is, yeah, really the expectation, whereas adding some of that additional value is is really important to actually look at, well, what does that actually mean for you? Um, and also what what's important to you as a person? You know, is it actually important to you to have 
ten million dollars, or are you happy with having one million dollars and and working part time? You know, it, it could be different things to different people. It's not all the same. Um, so whether it's you know investment or superannuation advice or, or risk advice, people's individual attitudes and values and beliefs are going to feed into it more than ever. So that's the stuff that's really important to focus on. Yeah, yeah. And before uh, we started recording this podcast, Marsha, we talked about uh, you know the, obviously the importance of risk insurance and and take up and the opportunity that's there. What advice do you have for the listener? Obviously, it, it is a challenge. There are challenges in terms of doing risk insurance advice these days. Um, you know, let's let deep dive a bit. Let's deep dive into this. Where does an advisor start at, with it sitting in their advice process and building a really robust structure around it? Yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned the word structure because I think that's important. Because I think with the way the the, the uh, industry has changed so much is. We did have kind of this divide, I suppose, in the past where we had advisors who were more risk specialists um, and advisors who were more, say, investment specialists. And those two would perhaps see each other at a PD day once a year and then exchange pleasantries, and that's about it. Whereas now we've seen much more of a shift uh, across the market for most advisors are giving holistic advice. You know, when I looked at the data, I think the advisor ratings data uh, most recently, there was only a very small segment of specialist risk advisors. But 90% still gave some level of risk advice. So from infrequently to frequently, they were giving some level of risk advice. So the challenge with that is if you're not doing something very often, you don't tend to get very good at it. So to make it effective, you have to build a bit of a process. So you've got to build a process of how you are going to do it when it comes up. And then also have a think about how it fits into that overall financial planning conversation. Because I think It's not a separate conversation. You know, if you're having a financial planning conversation with a client, you're already talking about various risks that they're exposed to, whether it's risks in their investment strategy, risks with their longevity, risks with inflation. There's all kinds of risks associated with their plan. Um, The risks to their health are just another extension of that that can be tackled in that same conversation. Yeah. And I think my my sense is the current challenges we've got this space in referencing that same advisor ratings report, 150 risk specialists in Australia, I think... When push comes to shove, advisors are probably not delving enough as a rule into this space as much as they used to because it got difficult. So, you know, working with people in the profession, product manufacturing, you know, people like yourself who can help, I imagine that's part of the way that you can help Marsh MLC Insurance and the wider uh, BDM network as well, helping build a structure and a framework around that as well. It is. And I think it's incumbent, I think, on all participants um, in the industry to do better in that space. I think I wouldn't be um, breaking any news at all to say that we probably haven't seen as much innovation as we'd like in general in the the, the insurance space. And that's for a good reason. That's because at the same time as the advisors have been grappling with all of the regulatory um, change that's been coming through, there's been layer after layer of uh, corporate regulatory change for insurers. You have to think about things like uh, DDO, for example, and unfair contract terms and IDOI changes. Um, you've just got resources getting pulled away from innovation to managing a lot of this regulatory change. So I think we're starting to see um, some change in that space now with some more innovation. I think across the board, we're seeing more digital uptake. Things like digital signatures are pretty widely accepted. Uh, yeah. Things like quotes and alterations online are starting to become more common. I know that's something that MLC Life's recently um, jumped into, and I think others are looking at as well. So mm. we're starting to see some things there that will help save some time for advice, but there, there's a lot of work to do. And, yeah. um, and and then in the education space, yeah, it's around us providing you know that educational content that can actually help advisors um, give advice well and, and give it efficiently. So we've certainly focused on that and a lot of the work we've been doing over the last you know six to six to eight months. Yeah, I don't think. And yeah, and that, that's fantastic. And I think there's also, there is significant elements whereby any time someone like MLC Insurance can remove friction from the process, which is great. I think there's also that education piece, but there's also a little bit, you know, a bit of, you know, the obstacle is the way, you know, it, it's worth the time, it's worth the work, because as we talked about earlier pre-podcast, that it's the outcomes for clients. I'm oh, a massive one on this. It's the promise kept. Um, you know, we talked about statistics and you know claims, whether it's eight out of ten, nine out of ten on average get paid. I think that's the reinforcement. I, I'm I'm pretty passionate about that. That promise kept. It's it's huge. That's the the proof in the pudding, and that's why sometimes it can take a little while. I think for 
if you're perhaps a new advisor to, to giving risk advice or you haven't, you know, perhaps got a large risk client book and you haven't had a lot of claims experience, you maybe haven't seen that practical example or those outcomes firsthand. Uh, but when you do, it, it makes a huge difference. That's a pretty overwhelming experience to see what it can do for, for people and the opportunities it can give them. Um, and the biggest way I would term it is it's no different to anything else financial in life is that um, money gives you choice, um, you know, and it gives you flexibility. And it's the same when it comes to ill health. You know, that um, money from insurance just gives you choice and flexibility to, to deal with that however you'd like and make sure you've got choice as to how you deal with it. And that's a pretty powerful thing to, to give to someone beyond just the dog or figure attached to it. Yeah. And I, I think particularly for those younger advisors who are listening to this and maybe they haven't gone through a lot of that claims experience with clients, reach out to your trusted BDMs, obviously MLC Insurance in particular, and um, get some of those stats. You know, within reason, we all like a bit of data, right? And there's PDSs and the like, but the power of claims, where they're coming from, and even stories. I'm sure most insurers have stories, claims experience stories, where it's really helped. I know here at Tribeca Financial, where we've, we've had advisors over the journey, it is at claim time where that real penny drops. We'll do the work and we'll set up that risk plan as part of you know, our legacy or our contingency strategy. But unfortunately, when people become terminally ill and think, you know, significant health events, when the claim is receipted, you just, you see your work at work, if that makes sense. Yeah, you do. You absolutely do. So those little testimonials um, and the data is, is gold. I think, yeah, absolutely. I think all the insurers have got, you know, nice um, uh, customer facing flyers that you can use with some of that, those statistics on them. I know, I think um, MLC Live just released uh, ours in the last week or so. So if you have a chat to your BDM, they've got an updated version now of, of last year's claim stats. So yep, your BDMs will be able to get that for you. There's also the APRA data. So APRA publishes claims data every year, which highlights, uh, and they split it out into advised cover. So you can get specific data around claims acceptance rates. Uh, and you're right, they're very, very high. I think in most of the segments, they're above 90%. Um, with with death and trauma being the highest above ninety five percent, so it really does reinforce to to clients that you know, the narrative of oh well the you know insurers don't pay claims this is a waste of money paying premiums that narrative probably is a little bit misguided so you can actually provide some data to them that, that supports that yeah no no make makes perfect sense Marshall if we take it back and you know in your in your mind thinking about high performing advisors that. You know, because obviously I'm a big one for for mindset and growth mindset alike. It's um, if we're thinking about you know some advisors who come to mind for you in this about you know their their personal habits. You know what what sets them apart, whether it's in business or them being an advisors. You know, because that's what we want to also look at today in terms of this well being piece. Is you know advisors looking after their own mental health and having a focus on well being. But we all we've talked about habits and structure. You know what. What are the commonalities amongst them? What, what what are you seeing? What what can people learn when they're listening to this? I think some of the things I've observed here that that tend to be common, I think, in those those kind of high performers is uh, that that big picture thinking. You know, not so much thinking about um, tomorrow or this week. It's around well, what does this actually look like, or what will this business look like in five years' time? Mm. Uh, what what do I want it to look like in five years' time, and then what does that mean for me today? Um, and what does it look like as, as well in the community? Like, what does my business touch outside of just my day-to-day clients? You know, what can I do to to give back? Because ultimately, that's something that I think is is really huge for um, an advisor. Um, and in that mindset and that sense of well-being is that engagement with the community. So I often find that you know, high-performing advisors and businesses, there's that various philanthropic uh, endeavours, there's community engagement, um, things that they're doing that actually um, bring their business to the community um, in a way that's beyond just the day-to-day with clients. And that's a great way to to get that feeling of well-being um, and get that feeling of uh, achievement and engagement in your business. Yeah. And I suppose, not to labour the point, Marshall, but conversely, it's quite easy to, in advice, to fall into a fixed mindset around compliance and regulation and the advice world or industry happening. Conversely, people doing things by choice, whether it's compliance, the clients they take on, the fees they charge. And I really, I do not harp or labour the point, but I, I truly believe it's a choice between the two. Yeah, it is. And look, I 
I think it's very easy to do that. I mean, I don't think you'd blame anyone for perhaps getting into that mindset because it does feel like some days that, you know, every every week was a new press release with something new, new form of regulation or something negative or whatever. And, and, and so over such an extended period as well, eight, 10, 12 years. For many years. So, so it's easy for that to happen. But you're right. I think the difference is putting that to the side and, and those who do well say, well, that's happening regardless. You know, not, not a lot I can do about it. All I can control is the way I run my business within those parameters. And I think an example for that is, um, you know, I think I've seen the uh, formerly FBA, now the FAAA, had been doing a lot of work around workshops on video SLAs. You know, that's a great example of, you know, but still only 3% of SLAs are delivered via video. And yeah. despite the, you know, the association promoting compliant ways to, to give that method of advice. So that's some examples of ways to think differently and go, okay, well, even within the current framework, put QAR to the side or things that may happen to the side, what yeah. can I do practically today to, to change things? And, and changing the mindset from, I think, you know, that is an indictment at 3%, right? So there's ninety up to 97% that are operating potentially around compliance from a state of fear or control, changing that to abundance. And the rules are what they are. Within reason, how do we gamify that to focus on client experience and get client, they are what they are, we can't change it within reason. How am I going to make the best of them as opposed to them just happening to us as practitioners? Yeah, I think so. I think once you do that, it becomes... A bit of a freeing mindset to say, well, I've actually just freed myself up from worrying about this now because I've acknowledged I can't control it. And then once you kind of let go of that, um, you start to move into a space of, okay, well, what can I actually do? You know, uh, and it becomes a bit exciting to actually think about, okay, well, is there some things I can change or do a little bit differently that might save me some time or give a better experience to my clients um, with my processes? And even something that I'm happy to volunteer what we've done at Tribeca Financial around this, Marshall, is we've changed the term compliance to PPR, professional principles or responsibilities. The reason being, it's designed to change the mindset around it. It's a professional principle. It's a responsibility that we're taking on. Nothing's happening to us. It doesn't change the law or, you know, or the, the compliance regime, right? But it is, it is a choice. So, And we want to come from a place of learning and, like I said, abundance and engagement as opposed to potentially up to the 97% where it is fear-driven and worried mistakes because invariably, I know personally in my life, anytime I'm worried about making a mistake, it probably heightens the chance of as opposed to do we embrace. And things like compliance, once there's understanding and true learning, not to pass an exam, but true learning around it, it, it it's liberating. It, it's actually quite a free structure when you truly understand. Yeah, that's a great example. You know, um, the, the C word can certainly elicit some negative connotations for, for people. Um, so yeah, why not change it Yeah, to, to a different terminology in your business? Think about it a little bit differently. Um, it's not saying it's awesome. I think it's, it's very clear to say, we're not saying that all of these things are great things and that you should be excited about them, but it's just that acknowledgement of, well, I can't necessarily control it. What are the things I can control to, to practically improve things? Spot on. And then that changes what we call this flashlight from things that we can't control to things that we can, like growing our tribe, like growing the people that we work with. We talked about delegating earlier, um, the clients we bring on. So who we say yes to, who we say no to, how we charge, the value we provide, the value proposition, obviously, that comes off the back of that. They're all things that are directly within our power. Just depends what we choose to focus on. Yeah, I actually really like that you brought up there around who you say yes to and the clients you bring on, because I think that is a big shift for a lot of businesses. And a lot of advisors I speak to as they grow their business is getting better at that, at the early stages of engagement, of working out, is this someone who is going to be good to work with moving forward? And, yep. um, and it could be different rules you have. Like I've spoken to different advisors who will have rules around like their initial questionnaire or fact find they send out to the client. They have an expectation that the client will have that complete by the meeting date. Spot if on. the client hasn't yep. done it once, look, there's a friendly reminder to say, hey, look, just notice you haven't done it. Let's push the meeting back a bit. Would this be more suitable for you? If they still haven't done it, then it's a conversation of, well, maybe this just isn't quite the thing for you right now and that's okay, but you know, um, it maybe just isn't the right point in your life to, to get involved in this. Um, and that way you're getting clients who you know, you're not going to be chasing them for things. They're not going to be the ones calling you 16 times a day 
uh, outside work hours, uh, chasing you on things, um, and they're not going to be creating that stress for you um, in your business. So I think that's a really key point is having to think about what that looks like. That's exactly right. You know, we talked earlier today around, you know, what binds us in financial planning is around the fact that we're all here to help, right? But I think sometimes that can drive us to be misled where we can chase a client or a prospect and depending where we are in our professional journey, flipping that on its head like you talked about and understanding how many first appointments do you actually have in a year or a quarter, how many clients you're willing to take on um, and creating within reason a sense of scarcity and urgency with clients. We are a profession moving away from an industry. It just changes the mindset around that. So if you're looking to engage two, three, four clients in a court, whatever it is, say it's two, you've probably only got two, uh, sorry, four or five discovery points you want to take. Start of a quarter, you got a few people who, oh, I don't know if I will, or I've only got three spots left. I can hold one open for you till Friday or whatever it is to book that in. Interesting, just changing this language and changing the mindset around it, that scarcity, scarcity and urgency can raise the urgency or the importance in a client's eyes. They've all got a priority list of things in their life. We just want to get top, closer to the top so we can take that stress, add that security and freedom of choice to them as well. So it's a really interesting point you make. Yeah, and I think by making that clear to, to people early, you get them to put value on your time. You know, It can be the thing that if you illustrate that early and say, for example, do say, look, I notice you haven't you know, completed the initial fact find. Let's just push the meeting back. Um, is it something that's you know still important to you? They'll often be apologetic and say, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Oh, I meant to do it. Mm. Really sorry. I'll make sure I do it um, and jump on and do that for you. I, I do want to make sure I do this. Um, and then when you do ask for additional information on whatnot down the track, they're aware that um, the time is valuable um, and that it's important to engage. So I think, yeah, setting those expectations is it's really important to to having that sense of well-being and, and enjoyment in your business. Yeah, because otherwise, sometimes it could become a relationship where the advisor or the business is chasing the clients as opposed to something like the 15-minute phone call, if they look like an ideal client, booking in the discovery, but normalizing with them that all people get that the completed client profile back within 48 hours. Most people want to be like most people. It's just the conscious language around yeah. that that can really create effectiveness in a business. I'm not saying technology and compliance, all that's, but some of the things that just change the behavior at an advisor or a practice level that can really help. Yep, yeah, and, and you're right. That language is important. You know, it can be things like, oh, you know, we find that our most successful clients do this or our clients who get really good outcomes, yeah, they get this, you know, they generally have this completed about 48 hours and that enables them to get into their advice quicker and, and get on the path quicker. So, those little, you're right, people want to keep up with the Joneses and uh, if you kind of set those little little sneaky expectations as you go, um, you can go a long way to, to getting you know more productive relationships. Absolutely. That's about all I had to cover today, Marshall. Is there anything else that you want to highlight in this conversation or you'd like to discuss? Uh, no, thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Great um, great to be on the, the podcast. Thanks for having us on and, and really enjoyed um, the discussion. So yeah, if anyone off the back of today wants to perhaps explore some of those resources I mentioned, they can jump on the, the Vivo Wellbeing uh, website um, and have a look at it or yeah, have a chat to their, their local BDM around what may be able to help them in the wellbeing space. Fantastic. Thanks again, Marshall. Thanks, Ron.